Welcome to Untested Builds, where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Except today, we're building one of my favorite characters. We're building a character who displayed a frightening degree of martial skills as a young person, became part of a ragtag group that would go on to defeat an evil emperor, live their adult life as a symbol, before eventually becoming disillusioned and retiring in seclusion until they became a reluctant mentor to the hero of a new generation. Can't believe we're finally building Luke Skywalker. But seriously, Toph Bay Fong is legit the best part of Avatar The Last Airbender, and you're doing yourself a disservice if you haven't watched the series and its sequel, The Legend of Korra. When we first meet Toph, she's a crass 12-year-old girl, completely embarrassing grown men as an earthbending professional wrestler. She gets recruited to Team Avatar to train Aang, the only person physically able to bend all four elements, and teaches him how to master earthbending. She does the impossible by inventing a new form of bending along the way to control metal. They work together to stop the Fire Lord, played by Mark Hamill, by the way, in case you needed any more Star Wars in this video. She surprisingly grows up to become Chief of Police in a badass St. Puck City, then decides to end that career and just slip away and become a straight-up druid in a vast mystical jungle at the spiritual heart of the world. And all of this while being born blind and literally seeing the world through vibrations in her feet, which she was taught to do by Badger Moles when she was just a toddler. If you're still here instead of watching or re-watching Avatar, then I guess it's time to go over the goals we have for this build. Bending isn't just about fighting, but in Avatar, the martial arts are interwoven into the bending arts. So it's not enough that we can just cast rocks into people. We gotta punch the rock that will punch them while using Hungar Kung Fu. We're also supposed to be blind. Toph is basically a sighted person for all intents and purposes if you're role playing her, but just remember that she can't see anything that isn't a three-dimensional shape and you're good to go. But there are things she can see with her feet that most others can't, so we'll grab some stuff to be a bit more perceptive than our crew. Lastly, we've been a professional wrestler, chief of police, a sage at various points of our life, so we're going to need some impressive soft stats to bring that gravitas to our roleplay. Toph is a human. That's not really a surprise. Most characters in Avatar are either human or a spirit with the occasional overlap. Where the controversy comes in is that we're a versatile human and using our free general feet for adopted ancestry selecting dwarf. I run into this situation a lot on this channel where the totally human characters in their source material have specific abilities that overlap with Pathfinder abilities that are only available to certain ancestries, sometimes for physiological reasons, other times because they're fantasy tropes that have just been with us since Tolkien. Usually I do my best to make human builds work as just human, but if the character in question spends any significant portion of their time being raised by someone who's not their birth parents, then adopted ancestry is fair game to me. Some GMs aren't going to be okay with your human character having literal photosynthesis or a second instance of toughness. That's cool. Just start as the ancestry with the physiological traits you want and take the human adopted ancestry instead if there are human feats you want. I just think it's a fair compromise that as an adopted human, you lose your heritage option essentially to take the feat in the first place. We also can't min-max our stats as effectively since we only get two boosts and no flaw. Speaking of stats, we use our two free boosts for charisma and constitution. We'll take the noble background. The Beifong family name carries quite a bit of weight even into the Earth Kingdom capital. We use our boost for charisma and wisdom. We also get training in society, genealogy, and heraldry lore, and the courtly graces skill feat so we can make an impression with the noble using our society skill instead of our diplomacy skill. For our ancestry feat, adapted cantrip lets us prepare a cantrip we couldn't normally use and cast it as though we were using it from our main casting tradition. All forms of bending are essentially telekinesis, but limited to the specific element in question. And if you want to hurl a chunk of metal or rock as a cantrip in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, Telekinetic Projectile is your best bet. We fling an object at a target and make a spell attack roll. On a success, we deal 1d6 plus our Charisma modifier and Bludgeoning, Piercing, or Slashing damage to the target. Probably going to be Bludgeoning damage if you're staying in character, but I won't judge. So there's kind of a thing if you've watched any other build channels on making Avatar characters, some flavor of monk since obviously martial arts go brr and that's fine. But Toph specifically is like never a martial character in the show. I don't think she threw a single serious strike in either series that wasn't to bend some kind of earth or metal. Without access to her bending, she was still very capable and resourceful like all of the other heroes, but in fights she was essentially a caster whose somatic components were punches and kicks. Specifically, an elemental sorcerer for training and intimidation in nature, and a boosted charisma and primal spells. Tanglefoot says vine covered in sap, but the amount of times we see earthbenders tripping or straight up burying people is too high not to have something for that. We make a spell attack roll, and on a success, the target gets a minus 10 foot speed penalty for one round, and on a crit, they are also immobilized unless they make a successful escape attempt. Press digitation lets us do little bending stuff like lifting or making small stone objects or clearing dirt and mud off of surfaces. 
Pummeling Rubble throws rocks in a 15 foot cone, dealing 2d4 bludgeoning damage and potentially pushing creatures back within depending on a reflex save. Elemental Sorcerers also choose an element to determine the effects of our bloodline spells. We're choosing Earth, obviously, so the Elemental Toss Focus spell basically just hurls a chunk of the ground at a target dealing 1d8 bludgeoning damage based on a spell attack roll. This also activates our Blood Magic. Every sorcerer gets blood magic effects when they cast their bloodline focus spells, but usually they're not relevant to the build, so we just skip them. This time, since we're actually going to be using our bloodline spells, every time we cast one, we get to choose between gaining a plus one status bonus to intimidation checks for a round, or we can just have the spell deal more bludgeoning damage equal to the spell's level. Both options are in character. Toph had a bit of a sadistic trick as a child. We also get access to burning hands and produce flame for free. But because of our bloodline, they deal bludgeoning damage instead of fire damage, which is strange and hilarious, specifically in the case of Produce Flame, since we could potentially deal persistent bludgeoning damage. Like, yes, I've just hurled a boulder at you, but now you have to contend with this cloud of swarming pebbles that continue to peck you until you can pass a flat check. Absolutely hilarious, but also terrifying. We'll pick up more skill training and deception, performance, and survival. If our ability boost will increase our constitution, dexterity, wisdom, and charisma. When I said we weren't building a monk today, I was only being partially truthful. That's because Paizo gave us an archetype that is basically only partially a monk. The martial artist dedication gives us all the cool kung flu flavor we'll need, but without needing to fiddle around with the pesky key spells, that's just going to get in the way of our much cooler bloodline spells. With this, our unarmed attacks do get upgraded to d6s and we no longer take the penalty for making a lethal unarmed attack, but don't do that, just keep throwing rocks and metal bits at people. It's much more impressive. Speaking of impressive, impressive performance lets us relive our brief stint as an underground fighter, allowing us to make impressions using our performance skill instead of our diplomacy skill. Anything to get out of actually connecting with people. Can't really blame her. A sheltered childhood will do that to you. Level 3 sorcerers gain signature spells for some added flexibility. For each level of spells we know we can select one spell that we can hide and reduce the level of freely. We still use the appropriate level spell slot when casting a spell, but as a spontaneous caster, this keeps us from needing to learn the same spells again at each level. Speaking of learning spells, we also get access to second level spell slots. Expeditious Excavation clears all loose gravel, dirt, and sand from a 5 foot cube, forcing a reflex save on any medium or smaller creature standing atop it, falling prone into the resulting pit and potentially taking fall damage. Dark Vision gives us Dark Vision for an hour, which may sound strange considering we're supposed to be blind and all, but consider this. If the party was in a cave or other dark area, Toph would be able to see the area and any creatures nearby with her daredevil foot radar. We've already got persistent earth damage, I'm sure we can suspend our disbelief a bit further here. Keeping in line with that, we'll increase our society skill to expert and take the canny acumen skill to increase our perception of expert proficiency as early as possible. As previously discussed, Toph is equally the most and least perceptive character in the Avatar universe, able to perform what was essentially a CT scan on Korra, but wouldn't be able to tell you what color clothes you're wearing. This also automatically raises our perception skill again to master at level 17, which we'll just have to do. Legendary perception would have been ideal, but making Sorceress Hoff is hard enough. Let's not complicate it further by trying to make her a ranger or investigator. Maybe if we got to see more than 32 seconds of Police Chief Toph in action, oh well, first again dream. We've got some basic moves, but it's time to get a little rebellious. The Charming Liar feat allows us to increase a person's attitude towards us anytime we critically succeed on a lie against them. Whether you're doing the traveling noble bit or the defenseless blind girl bit, lies are always a bit more powerful when they have a bit of truth in them. Now let's do something about this squishy sorcerer body. Good earthbending technique all starts with a stance. Mountain stance gives us a plus four item bonus to AC and a plus two circumstance bonus to being shoved or tripped as long as we are unarmored and touching the ground. We also get special unarmed attacks with the power of falling stone, but that's bad. Just cast your spells instead. Earthbenders aren't usually known for their fluidity, so there are some drawbacks too like getting rid of the dexterity bonus we would normally have to AC and reducing our movement speeds by 5 feet. At level 5, we'll use our ability boost to increase our dexterity, constitution, wisdom, and charisma. Magical fortitude gives us expert fortitude saves. We'll use our skill increase for expert survival. We might be good at lying and intimidating, but what we're really good at is taking care of ourselves, even if that means neglecting the people closest to us sometimes. 5th level elemental sorcerers learn fireball automatically, but since we're an earth sorcerer, ours deals 66 bludgeoning damage to creatures who fail a reflex save in a 20 foot burst instead. Shifting sands creates difficult terrain and forces a reflex save in a 20 foot burst on flat earth. Creatures who fail take a minus 1 penalty to acrobatic checks to tumble and balance and athletic checks to jump and high jump. We can sustain this for up to a minute and each time we do we can move the area of effect 10 feet in a direction of our choice. Any creatures who enter or start their turn in the space also attempt the reflex save. The stone cunning ancestry feed gets us even more in touch with the rocks around us. Toph knows her rocks, she can literally see inside of them. We get a plus two circumstance bonus to perception checks to notice unusual stonework. 
This includes traps that are made of stone and traps hidden inside of stone. We'll take the streetwise feat. We were never much of a homebody anyway. We can use our society skill and place of diplomacy to gather information in any settlement we frequent. We've basically traveled the whole world multiple times over. We can use our society to recall knowledge about those settlements as well, but the GM is probably going to make the DC harder than if you would just use your diplomacy. We'll take the Advanced Blood Lion spell for Elemental Sorcerers. Elemental Motion gives us one of the most insane earthbending abilities in my opinion. We get a 10 foot burrow speed for a minute, meaning we can just torpedo straight through the ground by spending a focus point. Level 7 Sorcerers are expert spellcasters who can cast 4th level spells. Stone skin hardens the target's skin, or in our case, surrounds the target in stone to give them resistance 5 to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage for 20 minutes. Reducing the duration by a minute each time a bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage attack manages to get past our mountain stance. Spike stones creates an area of difficult terrain and hazardous terrain for an hour, dealing 3 piercing damage to a creature each time they pass through a square. Freedom of movement allows the creature to ignore circumstance penalties to speed and automatically succeed on escape attempts against being grabbed, immobilized, or restrained. This is even more useful against enemy earth and water benders since we can also use this to counteract magical restraining effects as long as we cast this at a higher level than their spell. We'll use our skill increase for master survival and grab the toughness feat for an additional max HP equal to our level and easier recovery from dying checks. Katara is a good healer and the gang probably wouldn't have even gotten a season 2 without her, but she can't do all of the healing in the party. Natural medicine allows us to use our nature skill in place of medicine to treat wounds and if we're in a natural setting we can gain a plus 2 circumstance bonus to the check at the GM's discretion. Probably time to give Twinkle Toes another earthbending lesson. Mountain Stronghold upgrades our mountain stance by making our dex cap while in the stance plus 1 instead of plus 0. See, that wasn't a mistake at level 5. We can also spend an action and gain a plus 2 circumstance bonus to our AC until the start of our next turn. So now at the start of combat, we can enter Mountain Stance, fire off an Elemental Toss for 48 plus 4 bludgeoning damage, then put up our Mountain Stronghold for 27 unarmored AC at level 8, which is in line with some of the champions I've built for this channel. Level 9 Sorcerers gain Lightning Reflexes for Expert Reflex Saves and 5th level Spells, and oh boy is there a lot of Earthbending character options here. But Toph was also the first Metal Bender as well. Impaling Spike summons a cold iron spike that thrusts upward from the ground, forcing a reflex save on a creature. If they fail, they take 8d6 piercing damage, becoming immobilized for up to a minute. That's a little dark for Nickelodeon, but maybe the Netflix adaptation will have a few more lethal bending techniques. Transmute Rock and Mud allows you to turn two 10-foot cubes of rock into mud or mud into rock. Any creatures in the area turning to rock make a reflex save and get trapped on a fail. And areas turning to mud become difficult terrain if that mud is deep enough to require an athletics check to swim through. We can also turn stone ceilings to mud and deal 8d6 bludgeoning damage to creatures beneath who fail a reflex save. Wall of stone makes a 1 inch thick wall up to 120 feet long and 20 feet high. Any sections that are destroyed can be passed through but the resulting rubble is treated as difficult terrain. We finally get the thing that makes Toph the world's greatest earthbender and such a recognizable character. The Echoes and Stone Ancestry feat allows us to spend an action to gain Tremor Sense through Stone and Earth as an imprecise sense with a range of 20 feet until the start of our next turn, meaning we can perceive creatures moving on or beneath that surface. Maybe not with the absolute precision that we see in the series, but probably as close as you're going to get within Pathfinder 2e rules. Guys, now that we've basically got all our bases covered for Young Toph, before moving into Legend of Korra Toph, I just want to give a genuine thank you to all the viewers and subscribers who come back week after week to see what new craziness we're building, and an extra thank you to all the commenters. Without you guys, I don't know what I'd build, so keep the suggestions coming. And with that, I want to give a huge shout out to new patron, Francis, who just joined Untested Co. at the Alpha Tester tier, along with OGs, Michelle, Adrian, Decaffeinate, and Evan. Seriously guys, with all the new books dropping this year, your help has gone a long way towards keeping the content and especially the coffee flowing. Alright, now back to the build so we can start building Toph, the guru of the swamp. We use our ability boost to increase our constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma, taking skill training and diplomacy and grabbing the connections feat. We're a hero, cultural icon, and political figure at this point. Now, whenever we're in an area we spend time in, we can attempt a society check to arrange a meeting with a local political figure or ask a favor in exchange for a future arrangement. Just make sure you fulfill those promises ASAP because we're leaving civilization behind now. The whole Rise on Walker dedication gives us everything we need to travel the world in search of new routes to put down. We gain a favored terrain, meaning we can ignore non-magical difficult terrain while in our choice of aquatic, arctic, desert, forest, mountains, plains, sky, swamp, or underground terrain. As a Horizon Walker, we also gain a plus 10 foot circumstance bonus to our travel speed while in our favorite terrain. We can also give these bonuses to our allies while they are following the expert, but we're probably going to be traveling alone for the bulk of our wanderings. 
Level 11 sorcerers gain alertness for expert perception, simple weapon expertise for expert proficiency in simple weapons, as well as unarmed strikes, thanks to our martial artist dedication. The skill increase will use for expert diplomacy and six level spells. Continuing the theme of making our eyes as powerful as Toph's feet, Drew Seeing allows us to see things within 60 feet as they truly are, meaning we can see through visual illusions and we can see the true forms of polymorph creatures. Not too many instances of the latter in the Avatar verse, but she was able to recognize the reincarnation of the Avatar even though they had never met before. Maybe Toph got in touch with her spiritual side. Stone Tail allows us to communicate with stone spirits to gain limited information about the stone itself. Kind of treat this as an even more vague tremor sense. But we can ask about events that happened in the past or learn about objects that are stationary within or behind the rock. Ancestral Paragon allows us to go back and grab a first level ancestry feat. Rock Runner does a handful of things, but most importantly, allows us to ignore difficult terrain caused by rubble, rock, and stone, which is good because we make a lot of that just by fighting sometimes. If you thought Young Toph was cranky, just wait till you see Old Toph. Girl can make you feel weak, useless, and offended in one sentence. Bon Mo lets us get quippy in combat, allowing us to make a diplomacy roll against the target's will DC. If we succeed, they take a minus two status penalty perception and will saves for one minute. They can end this early by spending an action to attempt a retort at the GM's discretion. On a crit, the penalty increases to minus three, and if we critically fail, we get a minus two penalty instead. We'll get our greater bloodline spell, Elemental Blast, which forces a reflex save in a 10 foot radius burst, a 30 foot line, or a 60 foot cone. Creatures who fail take 10d6 bludgeoning damage. Level 13 Sorcerers get weapon specialization for an additional flat 2 damage on our simple weapon attacks, defensive ropes to increase our unarmored defense to expert, and a skill increase that we'll use for master diplomacy. Young Toph may have hated sand, man that Star Wars keeps creeping in here, but as a true earthbending master, we've learned to use it as well as any other earth or metal. Control sand creates a personal sandstorm and a 5 foot emanation, dazzling creatures who enter the area unless they pass a fortitude save. We can sustain the spell for up to a minute. Each time we do, we gain an additional effect of our choice. We can gain a sand shield that gives us a shield block reaction using 14 hardness to 21 HP and no broken threshold. We can perform a sand blast that deals AD6 slashing damage to a creature within 30 feet who fails a reflex save, or we can increase the size of the sandstorm to 30 foot emanation, suffocating any other creatures inside and dealing 64 slashing damage based on a reflex save. Mountain stoutness is basically another toughness feat. We increase our max HP by our level again and further reduce our recovery checks to only 6 plus our dying condition value. Wilderness Spotter lets us use nature in place of perception while in a terrain type of our choice. We're going swamp for lore reasons, but take whatever is appropriate for your campaign. Plains and mountains are pretty in line with the character too. We also get to use survival in place of perception and notice traps in that terrain as well. Hey, Elemental Toss is good. It's a one action damage spell. Let's do more of that. Bloodline Focus lets us regain two focus points when we refocus instead of one for more boulder tossing, ground swimming, and stone blasting. At level 15, we'll use our ability boost to increase our dexterity, constitution, wisdom, and charisma. We'll use our skill increase for legendary survival. We're also a master spellcaster with 8th level spells. Earthquake is the quintessential lithomancer spell, shaking the ground for a round in a 60 foot burst and doing a lot of stuff based on what's around at our GM's discretion like making the area difficult terrain and giving everything in it a minus two circumstance to attacks, AC, and skill checks, opening fissures that are 40 feet deep that creatures fall into if they fail a reflex save, and potentially collapsing structures dealing 11d6 bludgeoning damage to creatures underneath who fail a reflex save. Incredible Initiative gives us a plus two circumstance bonus to all initiative rolls. I wish perception could be a little bit higher, but this is a good consolation prize. Terrain Expertise gives a plus one circumstance bonus to survival checks while in a terrain type of our choice. Probably a good idea to have it be the same terrain type you choose for Wilderness Spotter and Horizon Walker. Mountain Quake lets us do even more in our mountain stance. Now we can spend an action every 1d4 rounds to stomp the ground and have creatures within 20 feet fall prone if they fail a fortitude save. The rogue with the boomerang might like that. More importantly for us, we increase the dex cap while in our mountain stance to plus 2 as well. We were never really a fan of that metal armor anyway. Level 17 Sorcerers gain resolve for master will saves and critical success results on regular successes. Arcani Acumen from level 3 finally blossoms into master perception proficiency. We use our skill increase for legendary diplomacy. We also get ninth level spells. And if you liked Earthquake, Upheaval is all that and more. Now we shake the ground in a 150 foot burst and at the GM's discretion we still pull in extra effects based on surrounding structures. The area becomes difficult terrain and structures collapse again, potentially dealing damage to creatures underneath. But now we throw stone pillars into the mix. 
10 foot square stone pillars rise 60 feet into the air. Creatures who fail a reflex save fall off the nearest edge, taking fall damage, of course. The Stonewalker Ancestry feat allows us to cast Melden Stone once per day as an NA spell, which isn't really an Earthbender thing, but getting to just walk into a rock without having to break it sounds pretty cool, I guess. The real reason we're grabbing this is because combined with our stone cunning feat, we can seek to find unusual stonework or traps hidden in stone that would normally require us to be legendary proficiency. See, I told you we were going to get as close as we possibly could to legendary perception proficiency. Young Toph usually got ignored until she proved her strength in combat, but with age comes wisdom, and as an elder, Toph is able to at least be heard at any table. Unless maybe it's her eldest daughter's table, but that's a different story. Legendary Negotiation allows us to make an impression on a target and request they stop their current activity, even if that activity is fighting us, and at least start a conversation. We do get a minus five on the diplomacy check to do this, but honestly, there probably isn't anybody in the world who isn't going to lend an ear to one of Aang's original crew. If you watched my Roy Mustang video, then you probably knew the real reason we wanted the Horizon Walker dedication. Favorite terrain is useful and in character, but Blind Fight is such a core part of the character that it's a shame we needed to be level 18 before we could finally get it. Now we no longer need to attempt a check to target a concealed creature, we are never flat footed just because we can't see our attacker, and we only need to pass a DC 5 flat check to target creatures who are completely hidden from us. The only things that are invisible in the Avatar universe are spirits, but assuming they cause vibrations on the ground, Toph would no doubt be able to see them and send the boulders flying as befits the situation. Level 19 sorcerers are legendary spellcasters who gain a 10th level spell slot. Take a turn to completely wrap yourself in metal and don't worry about any incoming damage. Indestructibility makes us completely immune to any negative or positive effects including all damage unless we want to be affected until the start of our next turn. The only exceptions are from artifacts of unspeakable power or a literal godly being has it out for us. We use our skill increase for legendary society and take a home in every port. Toph could probably just make a literal home anywhere with a patch of dirt, but seeing as how she's one of the most famous people in the world, I'm sure someone wouldn't mind taking her in for a night no matter where she finds herself. At level 20, we'll use our ability boost to increase our constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. We'll take skill training and medicine to get a bit more out of our wisdom modifier. Legendary survivalist allows us to persist indefinitely without provisions and to endure extreme conditions without taking damage. We like to live alone, as far away from civilization as possible, and we're probably one of the best people in the world at it. For our capstone feat, Bloodline Wellspring might be a bit underwhelming, but three focus points on a refocus instead of two will make coming out of retirement that bit easier when the youngins start making a mess in the world again. Now that we're level 20, let's examine the pros and cons of the build. First off, we bring the big damage, whether it's directly with earth and fireballs or indirectly by just bringing buildings down on people. The battlefield will be a hazardous place when we decide to throw down. Second, nothing is going to get past us when we're in our element. Underground, in mountains, or in stone structures, we basically have legendary perception combined with a plus five wisdom modifier. We can bring that bonus to our favorite terrain too using our legendary survival instead of perception, meaning we're an indispensable asset before, during, and after combat. Lastly, we're probably the single toughest caster we've ever built on the channel. With 268 HP and upwards to 42 AC before taking runes into account and optional sand shields and stone skin resistances means we won't be going down until we decide to. And if we do manage to get caught off guard, we've got the easiest recovery checks in the game. For cons, we're not very mobile. Mountain Stance and Mountain Stronghold eat up actions that could otherwise be used for positioning. That's on top of taking a speed penalty just for being in the stance. We've also got a pretty bad reflex save, which can be pretty problematic when the main bad guys you come up against are firebenders and other earthbenders. Our reflexes are bad in more than one way, we have no use for our reaction built into our kit at all. But hey, that's why you've got a party to watch your back, you just gotta lay your walls down and actually trust them first. Thanks for tuning in to another build. Quick announcement, tax season is starting to ramp up and my day job is in finance. So we'll be taking a short break from new videos for the month of February. We'll still be updating the character sheets on the Patreon and the Gumroad for those interested in the meantime. We've still got two more videos planned this month that I think you're gonna love. And with that, play more Pathfinder and have a lovely day.